Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ask the CEO with Avraham Gatile. Today's episode is very unique. In fact, if this is the first time tuning in to Ask the CEO, I would suggest you go back and check out some of the other episodes, as this one is very different from the rest. It features a presentation I recently gave in India for their Deep Tech Summit, and it's titled Deep Tech for All. We cover some of the latest trends and topics, such as digital disruption, artificial intelligence, IoT, 5G, and cybersecurity. Let's jump in and hear what it's all about. So I'll call the invite. The person who has come travel uh, from USA to uh, attend this session is uh, with us. Apologies if I spell your uh, you know pronounce your name wrong. So it's Abraham Gotehe, right? I did it. Thank you. Come on. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this session. I know it's been a very long day, so I'm truly grateful for you staying. Uh, thank you to Amit Dev and Babalao Jane for inviting me here. And thank you to all our previous presenters for informative presentations. So I'd like to open up with a quote from uh, Mahatma Gandhi, the father of this great nation. And he says, open the windows of your mind to allow the winds of ideas to flow inside. And this essentially means that one must keep an open mind in order to be able to accept the great opportunities that are presented to oneself, which is very fitting for the creativity that's required for innovating in the field of deep tech. And it has a personal connotation as well as it pertains to my journey from my previous career to where I am today. So the question is, why is information sharing so important to me? And before we continue, uh, how many people in this room are in the field of deep tech? Great, okay. Not too many, but it, it's a great start. And after all, that's what we're here for, right? We're here to learn. I myself am learning. I uh, actually met with industry experts from five countries in order to prepare for this session. And we're going to have the opportunity to hear directly from them as they play their clips throughout this presentation. So why is information sharing so important to me? Well, let me relate to you my personal journey, and uh, we'll discuss it as part of this presentation. I come from a 20-year background in telecom. I started my career as a software developer working for Avaya, the big phone manufacturer, and I had many jobs ranging from software developer to solutions architect to everything in between. Um, after I left Avaya, I started a consulting practice supporting Avaya partners with installation of uh, small business phone systems as well as enterprise contact center applications. And that worked well for a number of years until about 2015 when disruption hit. Now, everyone in this room, whether you work in deep tech or not, is familiar with that term, that dreaded term, disruption. So it was around that time cloud was becoming prevalent. Uh, businesses were moving their mission critical applications to the cloud and telecom was no exception. After all, it's efficient, cost effective and safe to purchase a seat of cloud communications for about $20 a month than to invest money in a PBX, a phone system, a metal cabinet that sits in a backroom closet, collects dust and depreciates. So I started noticing a decline in my business around then. In 2016, the decline got much steeper. And in 2017, Avaya, the phone manufacturer, the company who I invested my entire career in, went through a bankruptcy. And that completely knocked me out. The small businesses went either to the cloud or to competitors. The large enterprises were content to wait and see whether or not Avaya recovers before investing several million dollars in infrastructure upgrades. So that left me in a very precarious position. And I started thinking about my next step in my career. I wanted something that would have longevity. I didn't want to go through this again. And I started working for a company in Singapore that manufactured AI-enabled chatbots. So there I was in a new company, a new industry. I wanted to learn everything I could about the industry. After all, I come from a 20-year background in IT and communications. I wanted to leverage some of that, bring that into my new industry. But I didn't, I didn't know where to go. I didn't have money to pay for training. I didn't know whether or not the training was even relevant. 
Um, technology changes so rapidly, what's, what was recorded six months ago might not even be relevant today. So I had the good fortune of interviewing the CMO of the company I worked for, for my newly formed podcast, Ask the CEO, and he shared a wealth of information. And I remember listening to that podcast episode over and over and over again, each time gaining new insights. And I remember thinking, how cool is that? I worked so hard to create this content, and I myself am the beneficiary. And that's where I had a, an epiphany. How many people like me who went through disruption, who were displaced from their jobs, their companies, their careers, maybe even their businesses, and they want to learn about the technology, what are the latest trends, what's out there, and they don't know where to go. And that's when I resolved to build Ask the CEO as a library, a library of information shared by the industry experts, not just people that talk about technology, but the people that are working knee deep, the practitioners, so that we as a society, we as a community, have the information that we need. Now, the question is, was that really necessary? Did I go overboard? Did I really have to build a library? Can you just Google stuff? Well, the answer is it's not really so simple. Now, I love this picture <laughs> because it really conveys the message. Getting information off the internet is like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. I would have said fire hose, but fire hydrant is way more dramatic. So here's the thing. We're living in an information, we're living in an era of information overload. When you Google something, you get pages and pages and pages of search results. And when you finally find what you're looking for, you know, at the bottom of page 19, you don't know if it's credible. And let's say it is credible. There's another challenge. Do you know that there's so many choices out there that you've never even heard of? It's a big deal. I mean, there are people that are being super creative, innovating, they're creating solutions that could help us in our lives and our businesses, but we don't hear about them because their voices get drowned out by all the noise on the internet. So I took it on as my personal mission to share the words of these businesses, of these business owners, of these business leaders so that we can know what's out there and we are uh, presented with the best choices. So talking about disruption, the term disruption, like I said, uh, we're no stranger to that. Every industry is going to get disrupted, if not already, but it goes far deeper than that. I had the opportunity to meet up with Paul Comer. He's uh, a digital coach teaching cloud certification training classes in Brisbane, Australia. Paul is also an industry expert and a global influencer in cloud, cybersecurity, and digital disruption. A great person to follow on Twitter as well. And let's hear from Paul um, what his perspective is on digital disruption. As someone who works in and mentors people on the forefront of cutting edge technology, what kinds of trends are you seeing regarding digital disruption? You know, the last company I worked for, um, I worked for for 12 years, DXC Technology, we had to undergo a massive digital transformation. So if you like the word digital transformation is the transformation you have to go to, through um, to become competitive in this modern world and to be a disruptor yourself. That's almost how those two um, titles, I think, come together. Um, and so that trend that we see um, has been you know, permeating. And it's not something that's going to be limited to companies. Um, you know, every area of IT, every area of industry will be affected. You know, we, we, we've seen it with, with taxes, with media. Um, we started to see it in the banking sector um, across the world. Uh, certainly in, in the U UK and US, it's, it's probably at a faster pace maybe than over in Australia, just because of the geography and the size um, of the population. Um, but what we're seeing is we're seeing that um, that accelerates. Um, that digital disruption uh, really accelerates. Um, uh, and now we're seeing that move to governments. Um, so my prediction, a um, bit of a prediction here, um, is that every industry will be disrupted, and that does include governments. So that's a big deal right there. Every industry will be disrupted, including governments, which means 
that we must be super creative and keep innovating in order for us to have a secure future. Which brings me to why it's so important to share information. In the rush to create products, many people like to copy what other people have done. Um, you know, there's been an explosion of entrepreneurship, many people are under pressure, and we like to copy things because after all, it makes sense. You know, if something works, why not jump on the bandwagon? The challenge with that is that you don't know if the product that you're copying will be successful in the long run, or if it'll turn out to be like the next fidget spinner and fizzle out after a while. We need tech support here. <laughs> there we go. Simon Sinek is very fond of saying, you can copy what people do, but you can't copy why they do it. Um, this is why I strive to speak with industry experts like Paul Comer and those and many others that we're going to hear about, because we need to understand not just what the trends are, but why is this trending? Why are these trends happening? For example, Alexa is becoming increasingly popular, and because of that, we're speech enabling everything under the sun. Um, is that really necessary? Um, are we going too far? Why expend resources on something that might turn out to be a passing fad? So imagine the following. You're a single mom, you're trying to get your kids to school on time, but you're also the CEO of a high-tech IoT firm, and you're scheduled to deliver a presentation to the board of directors in one hour, and your house looks like that. I panic too. Your 10-year-old can't find his shoes. Your 7-year-old can't find her socks. The school bus is coming in five minutes, and you've got to get out of here. As you're frantically rushing through the house, packing lunches, gathering belongings, you suddenly yell out, Alexa, make me a coffee. Black, no sugar. It's going to be an intense day. That transaction had nothing to do with coffee. It had to do with the sale of time. People nowadays are busier than ever before. You don't have a minute to wipe your nose, let alone eat breakfast. All you want is a cup of coffee to get you through your morning. By speech enabling that coffee maker, you just sold that poor woman back some of the valuable time in her day, giving her just the semblance of control of her busy life and giving her just a little bit of peace of mind. So time is the new currency, and that's what's driving the mass adoption of voice-based technology in the marketplace. So this is why it's so important to study the technology and study the reasons behind it, and this is why I do what I, what I, what I do, and this is why I enjoy doing it. So we, you know, we were talking about AI today. We had many presentations about AI, and AI is going to be a part of our lives, whether we like it or not, and it's going to be part of every industry, and healthcare is no exception. I had the opportunity to speak with two industry leaders on AI and healthcare, um, and we're going to hear from them in just a moment. The first one is Diane Dotson, and both of these, um, both of these uh, industry leaders are in the United States. Diane is in Los Angeles. Um, she's a great science fiction writer. If you're into science fiction, she just published a book, which is a great book. You should buy it. I read it. Um, and most important of all, she's also a research scientist. And Diane shares a very interesting perspective on the future of AI in healthcare. After that, we're going to hear from Jennifer Esposito, who's the former head of health and life sciences for Intel. And she also shares a very interesting perspective. So we're going to hear from Diane now. One science fiction movie that really stood out for me when I'm thinking in terms of particularly health research is AI and machine learning and things like that is Gattaca. Look at the title Gattaca and the spelling of it and you see that the letters G, A, T, and C are in the word Gattaca and those are base pair names, the, the letters in DNA. When we talk about the future of AI in healthcare, what I'm really seeing involves genomics. We're looking at databases like 23andMe, for example. And there, there's so much information there for millions of people. You have their genomes. So you need an artificial intelligence to zero in on 
genes that lead to disease with all the computational power you have and all the millions of people you have that are part of these databases uh, you can find sequences of genes that you know lead to disease causing proteins and we can try to figure out from there how to tailor drug therapies you know like fix that broken protein so there you go right there going right to the source um, let's have the next slide um, now back up, back up one. It's not showing up. Not showing up. Okay, well then, we'll move on. <laughs> okay, so here's an important question. Will people accept AI? Uh, we're AI enabling everything under the sun, and we're also forcing AI upon people. So let's say, for example, you call customer support and you have to punch in a million numbers just to get to a queue and wait there for an hour to speak to a human being. Soon, we're going to have to do the same thing and we're not even going to have the privilege of speaking to a human, we're going to be speaking to AI. So the question is, are we going too far? Will people accept AI? Yola Burnett is a vice president at GFK Consumer Life in New York City. And Yola studies the consumer, tr uh, the consumer behavior that drives the latest trends in the industry. Also a great resource to follow on Twitter. And let's hear from Yola her perspective about this question. We have to ask ourselves a few questions. So first of all, you know, what is the need for AI? Uh, what is the specific use case? You know, um, it goes down to the value proposition. You know, what's in it for me? How badly do I need it? Does it make my life easier? Or, you know, does it make the process, you know, more effortless than me doing this myself? Because if not, it just can be downright annoying. And no, you will not accept that interaction. Or, you know, thinking about, um, the interface uh, does it feel gimmicky um, what is the accuracy of speech recognition or is there latent okay so basically what yola goes on to say after that is that we need to also ask ourselves does the consumer have an out can they can they choose to exit this interaction with AI or are they locked in? So it's really all about putting the consumer first. And that's essentially what's going to drive the success of our businesses in the future. So let's advance to the next slide. We heard a presentation previously about 5G technology. So I'd be remiss if I didn't say, uh, if I left 5G out. And 5G is going to be a big part of our lives because it's seen as an enabler, everything from smart cities to healthcare. I spoke with Inma Rodriguez. She's the VP of 5G Core Cloud and OSS for Ericsson's European uh, and Latin American mid-market area. And uh, Inma shares a, her perspective on the considerations that business executives need to have before investing in 5G. What are some of the considerations business executives need to think about before making an investment in 5G technology? Over the last year, we've seen the evolution of the different mobile technologies uh, and the generations, right? We started with 2G and making a phone call was like, wow, we can now make a phone call from the mobile and then an SMS. Then we started browsing in, in, in internet and it was like the big thing in, in 3G. And with 4G, we got to, to be streaming videos, and now you can, you know, you can see your favorite uh, Netflix movie on, on the train together with the rest of the people commuting. And that's what we expect from, from uh, technology evolution, right? So now when we go into 5G, I think we have to understand that this is not just another generation. This really goes beyond, beyond mobile broadband. It's exponential. Exactly. It will bring a lot of enterprises as an enabler for their digitalization process. So 5G is going to be more than just another G. It's going to be exponential, an enabler for enterprises for their digitalization process. Think about healthcare, for example. Imagine you have somebody that's waiting for an ambulance. There are no medical personnel available. With 5G, a dispatcher 
we'll be able to see what's going on, possibly even via VR, put on a headset. Now you see what's going on and deliver advice or emergency medical care through drones or robots while we're waiting for an ambulance to get here or a construction worker in Manila operating a bulldozer in Los Angeles. The possibilities are endless. Now, the scalability of 5G will enable us to deploy IoT devices at a massive scale, much more than ever before. So we also have to take a look at the implications with regards to cybersecurity. So if we look at the projections going from 2016 all the way up through a projected number of deployments in 2020, we can see a slight increase year over year going from 6.3 billion all the way up to 20.4 billion projected next year and these numbers keep changing all the time but essentially it's a nice steady progression and that is going to go up sharply in the coming years thanks to 5G. Now we also have to take a look at another statistic and that is the dreaded data breach, right? Not a day goes by where we don't hear about that. So what are the implications of adding more devices on our network? Unlike IoT deployments, the number of records breached year over year increases exponentially. From 2016 to 2017, we jumped from 36 million to 197 million, all the way up to 4 billion this year, and it, this year isn't even over yet. So we need, really need to think about um, what's happening and how to keep our network secure. Um, to put it this way, the threat actors need to get in through one door. We need to guard hundreds of thousands of doors in our enterprises and our factories. So this is a very serious consideration. And how do we fight the cybersecurity war? We're not going backwards. We're not going to stop deploying a technology, but how do we fight this war? So we do it with the three S's. We follow the three S's. We need to share information, secure our networks, and serve our communities. And we're going to go through what these mean. The threat actors have no problem sharing information. Whenever they do a hack, all that information is shared on the dark web. In fact, they brag about it. So they collaborate, they share information, and we must do the same thing. We need to share best practices. In fact, one of the industry experts who we're going to hear from in just a little bit, his name is Scott Schober, he was hacked. He's a cybersecurity expert. He has a cybersecurity company. He, had, he was hacked twice. And he wrote a book about it called Hacked Again, some great reading. So the point is, if something bad happens, share it. If you do something right, share it. Let people know because collectively we're stronger. I'm very grateful to Amit for forming uh, a global WhatsApp group. And we need to have groups that are more, of group, more groups like this where we share information. Industry leaders taking to the airwaves, presenting new solutions to the community. That siloed paradigm of yesteryear where everybody lives in their own silo and nobody shares information, that was gone with the turn of the century. Today we need to share information to stay ahead. And there is a company that exemplifies information sharing. Uh, and that company is Siemens with their relatively new initiative called the Cybersecurity Charter of Trust. And we're going to hear from their global coordinator, Kai Hermsen, what the Charter of Trust is all about. What is the Charter of Trust? The Charter of Trust is an initiative um, that we created with 16 other partners at the beginning of last year. It's an initiative that, as the name hints at, is trying to establish trust in the digital world. The very background of this charter is the notion that uh, digitalization brings opportunities and risk. Digitalization and cybersecurity are two sides of the same coin. Well, noting that and seeing that there is a, probably a new quality and a new quantity in cyber attacks witnessed over the last two to three years, we came together and said, look, if this is changing, if the nature of cybersecurity or the nature of cyber attacks is changing, we might want to think about new ways of how to tackle cybersecurity and how to look at it. 
with that notion, we came together and said, then we need to cooperate. We need to find other strong partners with which we can exchange on cybersecurity. And that's what it's all about. It's about the sharing, that collaboration. I believe that a, an initiative like the Charter of Trust has the ability to become the new gold standard by which we as consumers measure companies. After all, we're the ones that choose who we do business with and I would rather do business with a company that has declared and demonstrated that they take my data privacy seriously. So it'll be uh, great to see this um, initiative grow and expand in the coming years. So we shared, um, now we have to secure our networks. Here's the thing, I saw a statistic about IoT that we deploy about 127 IoT devices every second. That means by the time we go home today, in eight hours we deployed about three and a half million IoT devices, which is a lot. Um, so again, talking about how many doors we're leaving open. And the challenge is that even the most secure IoT device is vulnerable from the day you deploy it. I don't care if it's a veritable Fort Knox impervious to any and all attacks known to man. Because in six months from now, new technology is going to come out that will make these uh, devices, these secure devices vulnerable. So the question is, how do we defend our networks against attacks that don't even exist? And the answer is, we need a way to securely patch these devices, these millions, these billions of devices that we're putting out there. That sounds great, but if you think about a smart factory that has 600,000 devices, we could barely patch our Windows servers. How are we going to patch these devices? And let's say we download patches. How do we know that the patches we download from the internet aren't corrupted patches, that will infect the devices we're trying to secure. So here you have a secure device, and now you're handing the keys to the company to some hacker. So how do we solve this problem? This is why I met with Mirko Ross, who is the CEO of Ashwin.io, spelled A-S-V-I-N, in Stuttgart, Germany. Mirko is an expert when it comes to IoT security, and he shares two interesting uh, video clips on the challenges associated with patching IoT devices. What is the challenge with patching IoT devices? Can't anybody just do that at home or in the factory? Can't you just connect via Wi-Fi and update it? What's the big deal with that? A lot of IoT devices are at the edge. So what does it mean? They have no direct IP connection. So they are connected by other radio protocols like Bluetooth or LoRa. So you can't patch them directly. So what you need is the gateway in behind. Uh, so you send a patch to the gateway, and then the gateway is distributing the updates to the certain devices via LoRa, which is from a technical level completely different to an IP-based patch management. This is, I mean, this is a te technological challenge. The second challenge is often the scale. There could be hundreds, uh, thousands of them in a factory. A hundred, a hundred thousands, that's, that's right. For that, you need an uh, aut automation process because you can't do patching that manually. Next one. Mirko, I know many organizations have smart people there, and they might want to manage everything internally, including updating the software and patching it. What are some of the risks associated with allowing people to just patch their IoT devices. This is really a complex issue if you want to make it really safe and secure during the whole process. In future, we are stepping into a world where there will be more and more the question of what kind of software was installed on a certain component. For example, if an autonomous car will crash, there is immediately a question of what kind of software was installed at this car at a certain time of the crash. Just to find out you, for liability, was it a technical failure of the vendor of the car or what else? We need to know what was the state of the software. And for that, we need completely new mechanisms to update and patch. This is getting really critical. And by that, it's yeah. rather clear that you can't manually patch anymore. So this is why I share this kind of information so that we can learn about these companies and the technology they bring. 
Which brings us to the final S, serving the community. So we share the information, we know what companies out there provide the solutions that we need. Now we need the manpower to operate all these, all these security protocols, right? We're adding devices exponentially, yet we have a shortage in the most important field of deep tech, which is cybersecurity. According to Cybercrime Magazine, there's a prediction that there will be three and a half million unfilled jobs in cybersecurity in two years from now. So it looks like we're going backwards. We should be looking to fill these, these jobs. And the question is, how do you fill these jobs? Well, the simple answer is, we need more people. Well, where do we get more people? So if we look at the demographics, the breakdown of the people that are in the cybersecurity cyber community, uh, we need more women in cybersecurity. And that will help us not only fill those gaps, but give us a more holistic perspective on the challenges. Because we know that the value that diversity brings is that you have different minds that think differently, and that'll help us stay ahead of the curve. Well, that's easier said than done because there's a statistic out there. The percentage of women in cybersecurity is roughly 24% which is a very low number, how do you bring those numbers up? Or the question is really, why is that number so low and how do you bring that up? According to Alan Paller, who's the director of research for the SANS Institute, he says that when I walk into a high school Cisco networking class, I'll find 30 boys and one girl. So what's the message the girls get? You're not invited here. We don't want you. And it's a subliminal message that they get from early on. So it's no wonder that they're not even choosing careers in cybersecurity because they feel not welcome. What can we do about that? How can we change those numbers? There's only one way. We need to serve our community by mentoring and inspiring our youth, inspiring our girls when they're children so that they feel comfortable choosing careers in cybersecurity. And I'll actually share with you a personal story. <laughs> so this is a picture of me holding up a book by Scott Schober. I mentioned his name earlier. We'll hear from him in just a moment. And this book is called Cybersecurity is Everybody's Business. Very worthwhile reading. I was recently on a trip to Israel. I took my son in the, um, to Israel for the honor of his bar mitzvah. So in the Jewish religion, that's a very big time in a young man's life. That's when he becomes an adult. According to the Jewish religion, I took him to see the sites of the biblical homeland. And because I'm very active in the cybersecurity community, I took along some light reading. I took this book along so that I could catch up on my reading. Well, one day my son comes over to me and he starts gushing insights about cybersecurity, you know, 12 year old kid. And I look at him like he fell off the moon, you know, where did you get this from? We never talk cybersecurity, you have no clue what cybersecurity is. And he goes, from your book. And I said, my book? He goes, yeah, the one you left on the dresser. So he picked it up and started reading. So my first reaction was to grab my phone and take an interview because that's what I do all the time. And we took a nice candid interview. Uh, we had a lot of fun and of course I posted it on Twitter. Within a short time, that video got over 1400 views and uh, it caught on. Now, a week or so later, maybe two weeks later, we get a, a, we get a package in the mail. Scott Schober, the author of the book, sends my son a personal letter thanking him for the video, which turned out to be an awesome book review, and he sent him a gift, a nice puzzle that matches the theme of the book. And you can see by the smile on his face that he's probably going to be interested in cybersecurity. After all, the author sent him a letter. Now, who's Scott Schober? He's not some guy off the street. Scott Schober is the CEO of a cyber com uh, cybersecurity company called Berkeley Veritronic Systems in Metuchen, New Jersey. He's also sought after uh, globally as a cybersecurity expert. He was interviewed on CBS This Morning, MSNBC, and many of the network televisions, uh, television stations. Uh, he's also a global lecturer and speaker. 
So he took time out of his busy day to write a letter and send a gift to a young boy and inspire him about cybersecurity. Of course, I had to meet with Scott and speak to him about some of the areas of uh, expertise that he has. And one of the things that's very interested to us in this day and age is what are the tools that we can use to protect your digital wallet. So let's hear from Scott what that is. I'm working with a company, BlockSafe Technologies, and they've developed some exciting products that can protect. These are actually protecting the wallet to make sure that it stays in your wallet and not getting stolen in a, in a sense. Um, it's also protecting it at the ICO. So you have to look at the exchange there. Is it protecting information? And is it from one end of the spectrum to the other, is it got protection and encryption so nobody can get in there and steal it? Think about when you're trying to enter your, your password or pass key. If you're typing that in on a screen and there happens to be malware on your computer and you don't have any type of anti-key log or uh, software in place, what could happen? Somebody can get a copy of what you physically type in there or they can take a screenshot of it. So the software will actually detect if there's a screen capture or screenshot of you typing in your, your password, your pass key, as well as it will garble, basically encrypt and garble any keystrokes that you make. So you can see how Scott shares very practical information that we could apply to our lives. And Scott actually was traveling. He was uh, going to give a presentation that day, and he took that, this session from his hotel room. So this story was very inspiring to me, but it doesn't end yet. A few weeks later, we get another book in the mail by another cybersecurity author, Tyler Cohenwood, called Catching the Catch... The let me see if I can say that <laughs> properly. Catching the catfishers. It's a tongue twister. And she sent my son an autograph book. Uh, who's Tyler Cohen Wood? She is a, an 18 plus year veteran in the field of cyber intelligence. She worked with the U.S. government's national security with the Department of Defense and many other three lettered organizations keeping the United States safe from cyber attacks. So you can say she's a heavyweight cybersecurity veteran. She's also doing what we're talking about today. She's hosting the first, uh, it's called Cyber Girl Power Conference this summer. And the website actually doesn't look so clear on the screen, but it's cybergirlpower.com if you want to check that out. But this is exactly what we're talking about. People like Scott, people like Tyler, and other industry leaders that are devoting some of their time and their influence to help inspire the next generation so that they feel comfortable choosing these careers. So this story left me very inspired and it's just a very inspiring story all around. So in conclusion, we're living in very exciting times. What used to once be science fiction is now reality. From super moms commanding their coffee makers to robots working alongside us in the office. Our technology is evolving at a rapid pace, and along with that is our vulnerability to the forces of evil who want to rob us of our money, destroy our businesses, and take down our governments. I'd like to conclude with a heartfelt request to everyone to help me continue my mission of making deep tech accessible to all by sharing my library, which is called Ask the CEO, that contains the words of wisdom shared by those industry experts I shared with you today, as well as those of many others. And this way we can stay informed on the latest trends in the industry, as well as the choices that are available to us. And most, imp most important of all, let's resolve to mentor and inspire our children, especially our girls, so that they have the opportunity to choose a career in high tech like cybersecurity, which will give them fulfillment and grant us, our society as a whole, the best chance of enjoying the many benefits our advanced technology provides us with in safety and security. Thank you very much. Really nice hearing from you. Uh, though the day is nearly ended and only few people are around. I would heartily thank Avro for flying almost 19 hours uh, non-stop. 
I already lost track of not <laughs> sleeping two days. Uh, yeah, and he is a big victim of the jet lag. Uh, though uh, today he seems to be quite or uh, alert in telling all the things. Nowadays we are talking of this artificial intelligence, the way it's growing fast beyond our control. Don't you think that uh, our human natural intelligence will be threatened like said by Mr. Stephen Hawking and they are creating more of the disease and disorder. How we are going to handle this type of problem? You know, I love that question because I, I hear it all the time. So he, here's the thing, this is all part of, we've heard that word before, that digital disruption. Right? Um, all the previous industries are getting disrupted, all our jobs are getting disrupted, taken over by AI and automation. And it's really the same thing. And this, is, this is the basic fear that people have. Will we become disrupted? We as individuals, will AI take over, you know, take over our role in society and the world? Well, if you look at, I mean, I, I just shared my personal journey, how I evolved from being a, a telecom consultant to working with global brands and global leaders. This didn't happen overnight. This was an evolution. I was in one, in one, you know, one part of my career. I was disrupted. I was in rock bottom. And I figured out a way, with God's help, to move on to the next part of my life. And if you look at every industry, you had, uh, you had horse drivers. And we don't have any horse drivers today, but we have taxi drivers. And those are going to go away soon with autonomous vehicles. But we're going to have people that will drive you know, drones and or people managing autonomous vehicles or you know, whatever it is they, they'll get to do back then. So it's really a question of leveraging our uniqueness, levering what makes us unique, what makes us best at who we are. And by doing that, there's no way we can be disrupted. We, there's nobody like us. Each and every one of us are unique. We're individuals, and we all have our uniqueness, but it's about tapping into that and, and discovering what is it within us that is unique that cannot be disrupted. So manual labor has no value, nothing at all. Labor, how hard you work, unfortunately, has no value. The only value there is in, is in what value can you bring to others. And by tapping into that and by answering that question, I think our, our future will be safe and secure.